Hey, everybody. Welcome to Huddle Time with Ronit. It's been uh, a week, and uh, it's Monday, Monday morning here in Seattle. It's 11 o'clock. It's 1 o'clock in Central Time, and it's 2 o'clock Eastern Time. So how are you guys all doing? Uh, we are almost at the end of September. Kids are back to school, almost. They might be at home schooling, or they might be outside schooling. Uh, but we hope that things are starting to feel a little bit more structured or actually with more certainty. I know there's a lot of balls up in the air, but we are here at huddle time and I'm, I'm really excited to be here um, this morning, this afternoon or this late afternoon. So for anybody who's coming in, uh, welcome to huddle time. Thank you for all for tuning in to America Beauty Show by the Cosmetologists of Chicago. Each Monday for our show and our talk show, uh, we help. We give a lot of inspiration tips. We give a lot of helping suggestions. We bring a lot of experts into the show. And we have some fantastic guests that are going to be sharing their knowledge, their expertise, and what we can do today, right? To support your career, to support your business, to support your mental health in all of this. My name is Ronit and I'm a wealth and mindset coach, founder of Salon Cadence Academy. Salon Cadence Academy is a high-end coaching and training company who helps entrepreneurs and beauty professionals join to be the top 5% earners in the industry. So you create more time in your life so you can have more wealth in your life and you can really achieve your ideal, uh, your ideal goals. This week, I'm so excited to uh, share um, my friend Leon Alexander with all of you because we're going to talk about some elephants in the rooms that nobody is actually talking about. We're going to really bring uh, you guys into some reality chat and some things that maybe if we all share with you, you're actually going to feel like that's it. This is what I'm going to do. We want to motivate you. But more than anything, we want to just let you think differently so you can do things differently, so you can have the results that you really want. So um, Leon Alexander is the president of Eurisco Designs. Now, he might be mad at me how I pronounce it, so but I, I always butcher names, right? Originally from London, England, yeah, United Kingdom, Leon began his career at Vidal Sassoon and became Sassoon Organization's general manager. Wow, is that, is that unbelievable? He went on to acquire and ran a collection of 320 salons and spa located mainly in the in United Kingdom. Now, Leon next launched an AVD Cosmetics LTD, and to his credit, is been growing the company for over $40 million in annual sales. So he knows a lot about profitability and sales. Now, in 2006, he launched Eurisco Designs, which is a beautiful company, and here is why. With a vision of designing space around the emotional needs of the consumer, accommodating the functionality of actual service. He has studied how customers really think, how do they buy, and act with specific environment and designs that fits the location accordingly. Now, Leon's educational background includes a really decorated degree in behavioral psychology from uh, Rothman Institute in London. He has keynotes, he is the keynote speaker of many industry conferences, including ISBA, Intercafier, ISBN, Aveda Congress, Serious Business, and Euphora. So he is so well respected in our industry. And in additionally, in a wide range of educational presentation that he does, yeah, he is also had a great TED Talk, which named Why People Buy the ultimate consumer location and creative and lateral thinking, which is phenomenal. It is time for a new business model. That's his other one. And Leon is the author of A Window into the Consumer's Mind. And his primary objective and mission is not to only share with you his 
knowledge, his experience, his researchers, is to elevate and change the thinking of the beauty industry. So with all due respect to all of this, I'm really excited about bringing Leon in, mainly because we want to blow your mind. So welcome, Leon. Thank well, you. I hope I didn't butcher too much of the, of the, of the okay. cool names. <laughs> you pronounced much worse, I promise you. Oh, good, because, you know, just between having Ronit's language, and as you know, now my writing is fitting my language. Um, I'm glad I did good. <laughs> How are you, Leon? I'm very well, and you? I'm doing phenomenal. It's a, it's a really, um, you know, great, I had a great weekend. It was Bill's birthday, and we celebrate his birthday. He's still oh. in the 50s, you know, but he's in his last year in the 50s, so we had five pizzas which i love it's my favorite food and we have a great cake and we had a great time what did you do this weekend you know i uh, did a lot of planning um and uh, organizing and thinking uh and reading and writing um just exercising just being outside and healthy florida is beautiful this time of the year so uh, mm. yeah i i I dedicate a certain amount of my day to studying, studying uh, some of the best thinkers and uh, seeing if I can glean something from that to look, uh, to be a thought provoker and a visionary for the future. Mm, yeah. Uh, you know, I was, I was thinking about your telling me about a lot of teaching and a lot of reading. I feel like um, a big part of, of, change and a big part of adjustment or a big part of uh, creating action, especially in economical changes, is, is reading and researching and preparing yourself for the next one. It's not so much of making the change right now on a panic mode of, you know, uh, flight or free, but it's a lot about starting so when the next change will come, we're prepared for something even larger than that. Do you agree? Yeah, I, I think I think so. I mean, look, what what a lot of people do is they make change when they have to make a change, and that's sometimes too late. I think what you have to do is you have to have a vision of where you want to be in two five years. Is your model where you want to be in the right growth of the consumer? Uh, but when things are going up, that's the time to think about what's next, not when you're at the plateau. And what what's happened? And what particularly as COVID has affected everyone, now people are thinking in crisis mode of what they're going to do. So I think if you think as things go up positively, what growth can we do to elevate the business? What will be needed in a year's time? And one of the questions I always ask salon owners is, what are you doing differently next year than you did this year? What, what services will we be offered? What, what experiences will you be offering to the consumer? Not yeah. so much the same model each year. Right. And unfortunately, we all get stuck within doing the same thing, the, every year the same thing. You know, I had a coaching client this morning and uh, I asked, so since our last coaching call, uh, what have you done differently? Or what have you tried differently? And one of the things that that I was listening to is how they were going to approach the holidays in the same manners and somewhere maybe change the, the shopping experience differently of what they've been doing before because they cannot do promotion for the holidays in the salon because you never know, we might be going to, to a lockdown. So what are they planning to do something differently? And, and unfortunately, I feel like sometimes... Um, we get so stuck in what we have been doing in the previous years, the same thing, which in fact, every year should be something, whatever works, maybe do it again, and then add something different. So this year for the holidays, there's gonna be a lot of uh, different things that we need to consider doing. Um, have you thought about that? Well, uh, for the holidays, particularly on a business perspective, what we have been doing before um, annually is creating promotions for Christmas. Um, that shouldn't stop, 
but I think you're going to be doing a lot of online promotions and delivery rather than just from the seller. Um, we have to broaden what we sell to the consumer. You know, I, I, I think I've mentioned this before that it's the same consumer that goes into Apple or Starbucks or any serious retail or service provider that comes into our salon. And when you go to Starbucks, you look at Starbucks and you think, well, they're a coffee house, but they sell tea, they sell wine and beer at some locations, they sell food, um, they sell newspapers. You look at CVS and you think of them as a pharmacy, but 35% uh, of what CVS sell are things like cosmetics. And gas stations sell things, they wouldn't survive just on gas. So I've always thought about the industry, why are we only selling wet products when they're in a location? The goal of any business in or out of our industry is to maximize the profitability of our business, maximize the potential. Mm -hmm. So we should be looking at things other than wet products to sell the things we need. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, we, we were talking about having this conversation uh, right now live and how important it is to be alive. And um, what's the benefits of having a dialogue and sharing with the world live is because um, one of the reasons is because it's authentic, it's organic. It it, it's, it's working within the now. Uh, so anything can go wrong. Uh, this is not a pre-recording session. Uh, and, and it keeps on leaving. It keeps on vibrating. It keeps it keeps going, and that's how you know we need to look at at our businesses. How we're going to keep the vibe going. How we can keep the excitement going within your staff or or outside in the clients. And right now we need to do things that are a little different. And I'm saying that is because you and I went back and forth of 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 the reality and what we need. Uh, to do to do this, and we booked you obviously a, a few weeks back, and and we changed our topics a couple times because things are changing from right to left. There's still there's some uncertainty, and I'm bringing it to you because I want to address everybody who's listening, who is going to be listening, that right now what Leon and I decided to do is not to identify the problems anymore. We know where the issues, we know profitability is key. We know about a lot of good things, but we want to provide with thinking and solutions. So today I want to talk about that big elephant in the room that nobody is talking about because everybody is sugarcoating what's going to happen in the next few months. Now, I don't want to be negative, but I want to bring everybody awareness that if you're not going to make some changes, if you're not going to do something a little bit out of the ordinary, you might not even make it. So what, and I'm a love talking to you, Leon, because you're such a reali realistic person and you see if you've seen this before. So um, before we even touch with all the solutions that we've been talking about, you have such a great, background behind you. You have done so much to the industry, for the industry, and learned so much from great experiences. Tell us the, your background. How did you start it? You were at Vidal Sassou in the United Kingdom. You're in Sarasota right now, but you're all over the place. So tell us how you started. Um, well, I, I qualified at a young age with a PhD in behavioral psychology. What do you do with a doctorate in behavioral psychology and no life skills? you go into the beauty industry. Uh, and that's exactly what I did. And I joined Vidal soon and uh, I worked my way up on the business side of it. Uh, I was a, a stylist for several years, but I enjoyed the business side more. Uh, I worked with talented people that I thought I would never be at that level. And Christopher Brooker and Trevor Sorby was my art director. And I realized that I was had an inkling for business. And after 10 years, I became general manager of that company. What Vidal taught me was integrity, passion, and creativity. Um, after 10 years, I needed a fresh challenge. And with a partner, we acquired groups of salons. And I ended up 
amalgamating six groups into 320 salons, mainly in the United Kingdom. What that taught me was systems, programs, and solutions. When you have that infrastructure, you need to be organized. So that taught me the systems, programs, and discipline. I then had an opportunity of, um, with a partner, obtaining the distributorship of Aveda in Europe, in the United Kingdom mainly. Um, half a million dollars of inventory was coming over from uh, the state, from Minneapolis. And there was no real marketing plan. We obtained the distributorship, but I looked at other brands and what they were doing is they were selling it with reps going into salons saying, you've got to try this product. So I was mindful of what Walt Disney said. Think of what the competition are doing and do completely the opposite. And we didn't go into salons. We went into department stores like Harrods and Harvey Nichols and House of Fraser, into 36 department stores. We took away the counters and we stood next to the consumer in the retail location with, against Chanel, Mac, Shuramora, Estee Lauder, and we became the number three house in Harvey Nichols. So that taught me the systems was required and there was, an, there was an objective that I had. The objective was to be in every consumer's bathroom with the brand name. And so once I learned how to retail, like competing against the best retailers in the world, we then went into salons and we said, I'm not gonna show you from a manual, I'm gonna take you and show you how we retail. And so that really evolved us to growing the brand uh, at, in, in th throughout the United Kingdom. Um, when I came to the States, Esther Lauder acquired a beta and they bought a company out. Um, I looked at what was here and there were some very good things happening in America. But from a retail perspective, no one was designing space around the emotions of the consumer. They designed design space around a service business. And I realized having owned salons, and I say this to salon owners all the time, I don't think you own a salon. I think you own a business that happens to be in the beauty industry. So true and so profound. You know, we don't value what we do as business. We value, uh, you know, what we do as afterthought. And uh, we are a salon first and an afterthought is a business. Right. Where we have to think about that's not the case. And it, it, we need to change that that thought. Um, you know, you said, you said something that uh, provoked a thought into me. Uh, you said that uh, Vidal Sassoon has showed you that you need to have passion, integrity, and creativity. Now, how can you have creativity at all? I don't know how you do it. You might be a Superman. Um, when, when creativity is so important right now, more than ever, more than ever, uh, to be an innovator, if anything, and to be creative, how can you do it if you as a salon owner or of you as a, as a stylist dedicated to a suite or a chair, all you do is work hands-on 24-7, 24-7. How can you become a business owner? And as a matter of fact, you know, again, Leon, you, you're saying it's like you own a business, you don't, you don't own a salon. It happened to be a salon, which is so important. You can be a lawyer uh, and you can be a lawyer slaving to your business. The same thing, whether you're a lawyer, or you're a doctor, if you sell time, if you sell services, you have to find time to be creative. So this, this is like um, uh, music to me when you said that, because the most important thing is that you need to invest in having that time to be creative. So that's, that's a very, very good question. Um, creativity forms different levels. I can't paint. I can't do sculpture. Uh, creativity is not something that's just art. You need to be creative in your business. And what I mean by that is that there are excellent forums for business within our industry. You named a few of those. If we really want to not 
just go, as we call it, the next level, which I, I never liked. If we really want to maximize the potential of our business, period, then we need to study the best retailers outside of our beauty industry, like Apple, the best marketers, like Walt Disney, the best service providers like Michelin restaurants, and emulate those best practices to find out what makes them successful. I mean, creativity is, is so important, but structured creativity from a business model. Um, I, I always, when I start a new business, I always start with a strategic blueprint. And that strategic blueprint is the creativity model going forward. Uh, because because you, you have to be creative on your business, not just in your business. You could stand behind a chair doing hair and be extremely creative, but not necessarily make a lot of money. Mm. Mm. You need to be creative on your business. And you it, you it, need to be intentional about making money, you know. Uh, well, it, it, intentional about having a financial plan, uh, having a marketing plan, having a strategic blueprint, understanding what your mission is, clearly understanding what your mission is, understanding your vision, understanding your core purpose, understanding your strategic competitive advantage. So you're in a city with maybe 20 salons. What is your strategic competitive advantage? And once you've understood that, you need to communicate that to your team. You need to communicate that to your clients. You need to communicate that to the media. So the next thing you have to understand is, okay, so that's my vision. What are my resources? What's my financial resources? What's my human resources? What's my technological resources? Because if you don't have those resources in line, it doesn't matter what vision you've got. So then you have your initiatives. What is it I want to do? So I want to bring a wine bar in. I want to bring a coffee bar in. I want to bring additional products in. I want to design my, my model and look at it differently. So you have to create three or four initiatives. And the next thing is you have strategies. What will make my initiatives work? And the last thing is key measurements. How do you know you've achieved your initiatives? You have to measure it. If it's not measured, you can't manage what you don't measure. Absolutely. So you can, if you don't know where to where you're starting and you don't have yeah. benchmarks and you're not getting to to the ultimate goal, then you're kind of like stepping on the same sand and going back yeah. instead of, of going forward. And I and I, you know, I love what you said about uh, you have to have intentional um, plan. You have to have some sort of a blueprint. So, of course, Leon, and I'm sure you agree to that, that when we create a plan. It can be simple. It doesn't have to be that complex, especially if you're in, you want to be um, a top earner. You want to be profitable. We all know that 70% of small businesses are closing doors between the first and the seventh year. 25% are leaving paycheck to paycheck. It doesn't matter how big you are. It doesn't matter how small you are. It doesn't matter uh, it, what business you are this is the reality right if we want to be in that top five percent where um you also enjoy what you're doing we have to have a really good uh, view of what we want to do and you're saying you have to have a mission you have to have um some sort of values that you live by and Absolutely. before you have the milestone roadmap, you have to know who you are and how you want to show up and how you want to work. Uh, and it doesn't align with your mission and doesn't align your profitability. Can you give us an example of what if, if anybody decide to redo the mission, to reinvent their uh, or even explore deep inside? What's a really good uh, practice or exercise to do first with yourself? Well, uh, I, I think first with yourself, then you're in a team uh, because there's no point having a mission that is not obtainable. There's no point having a mission that's not profitable. Uh, there's no point having a mission that will be dated 
in five years' time. So that mission has to be sustainable. And if you want to have a mission that was to educate your consumers to environmental methods and, and run a salon in, as an environmental salon, but yet make it profitable, that's sustainable because that's not going to go away. Uh, if, if, you, if you have a mission to educate consumers uh, on different issues relating to beauty, then education is critical. Your mission may be that you want the highest standards of training. And I don't mean just technical training. I'm talking about communication training for your staff and how, how to develop their own business. I think if you're working in a salon as a service provider, you are in business because your income is determined by your clientele and what you sell to your clientele. So we need to help people be successful in their business, and that might be a mission. So it depends on the mission, but you have to make sure that it's sustainable, it's going to be around, and it's profitable. And so right now, when COVID hit us, um, you know, we're, we've been forced to do things a little bit different, obviously, very different. What are the things that you see as a consumer, as the consumer eye? Um, how can we, we, and we talked about it. We said, you know, you and I had many conversations around this and we said, you know, it's all about the experience, but now the experience has to be a whole different, right. a, a whole different level. So I want to help our audience uh, sure. in, in that manner to be really specific and give them some really good solutions. I, I will. Um, so we have evolved in this industry fr um, from service. And some of the better salons now are saying they're giving an experience. And I'm sure that they are. The problem is, it's a generic experience. Because if you give me a value-added service, complimentary makeup, a uh, hand massage, a scalp massage, or any value-added service, and you give the next consumer exactly the same, it's a generic experience, mm -hmm. the future in or out of our industry, because it's the same consumer that goes to Apple, that comes into a salon, yeah. is personalized experiences, not generic experiences. And if you worked, if you were going to a restaurant and uh, the, the maitre d' greets you at the door and he escorts you to a room, uh, and he offers you a complimentary cocktail. He says, you were here two weeks ago. I put your favorite bottle of wine away. And uh, you, you, your, the meal that you had, we've got fabulous fish today. I know you like this. You had this two weeks ago. Your record in that restaurant is recorded. And you have a fabulous personal time because of that service. It doesn't happen often. But when it happens, it's powerful. You see, people talk about poor or excellent service. They don't talk about good or average. You know, if something's good, okay, it was good. But if something's great, they say, I went to this salon, it was great. And they talk about it. If something's bad, I went to this salon, I had bad service. So we have to make sure that we elevate our experiences to personalize experiences because to me that's the future of any business so personalizing in a way and i agree with you you know i went um bill and i went to um try to fix his his computer there was a battery the battery wasn't working and it was dying and um we said okay let's go let's go to the mall and you know we we geared up and we went over there and we had the most incredible service. Now, we didn't get what we want immediately. It just, we didn't. Um, you know, there was a, a line to wait to go for retail. And and, uh, and this is a true story. This is amazing. So here we are, we're coming to the mall. You would, you would, uh, we would be so scared to go to the mall thinking everybody's not going to wear the mask. But just to walk into the mall, you had to wear a mask and there was people are watching you doing that. So you felt comfortable and you felt safe even in the mall. They limit the people to be there so it doesn't feel crowded. Now we're at the Apple store 
and there are six personnel with iPads waiting to serve you. And the very first question is like, what are you looking here to do today? And immediately when we told them what we needed, they classified us to which person is going to take care of us. When we expressed what we wanted, they gave us two options. You can either um, make an appointment to come back to the store or you can just, we can send you a box where you can put your computer in, we'll, we'll receive it, we'll fix it and you'll get it back. And so there was such a knowledge, the systems were the way they are, each and one, and it was so clear, we understood exactly what we need to do. And we felt like maybe we didn't get an instant gratification of let me buy the battery right now, but we felt very safe and very, very well taken care of. And we, we knew that we're going to do it. So that is what you're talking about, elevating and optimizing the most of your time and the most of what you needed so we can give you, so you can stay with us, so you don't have to go anywhere else. Right. How can we, let's talk about some, some really good tips of how can we do something when it's in our salon? What, what will be uh, uh, some good tips? Well, one of the things that I've noticed whenever I go into salons is uh, uh, there is a, a, a difference in the age group of people in those salons from 18 up to mature. And you go in and there is one track of music playing that it, it, it can't be right for every consumer. So I love one of the things that, that we, we looked at was to create individual pods. And this is pre-COVID, um, where you would go into a pod and you would be able to select jazz, classical, or if you've got a headache, no music. To be able to work within an environment that's personalized to you. Yes. Um, the other personalization is this pod. Um, whenever you have color in the salon, the salon has a lighting system. And that lighting system is different than your office or when you go in the street or when you go home. So to have a multiple lighting systems where you can see what that color looks like, in different environments, mm. personalization. Uh, in some sounds that we've designed, and this was pre-COVID and it will happen again after COVID, we've incorporated and collaborated with a local wine or coffee company so that they operate within the salon and they person and they sell they sell the wine, champagne, coffee. Now, of course, that's not right for all salons. A, You've got to have a certain size to do that. Um, so, but these are kind of some of the things we're doing. Uh, one other thing is very important from a personalization point of view is when a salon's had her hair done and she gets up and goes to pay, the chances of her buying retail diminishes by about 90% by getting up from the chair and going to the retail area. So knowing that, what we did was uh, we created styling stations with mobile devices like an iPad built into the station with all the products built in. And the service provider brings up the products they used on the consumer that day. And so these are the ones I use on you. Uh, let me show you how you use them. And you click on it, it shows a video of it, you show what products link to it. And the consumer's profile is already linked into that iPad because they're regular, their credit card, their personal details. The consumer can order by sitting in the chair by an Alexa system, voice activated to those products and get them shipped with them to the home in 24, 48 hours. So these are some of the things that we need to look at in yeah. personalizing the profile, the avatar uh, of, of that consumer instead of generic. Uh, you, we have to we have to create a wow effect now yeah. from the rest. Right. Yeah. So, for example, uh, you know, talking about wild effects, what you can do is collaborate with your community. So, um, around us, we have 
um, in every salon, we have friends that own restaurants, we have friends that own boutiques, we have friends that, that have bakeries, uh, breweries is really big right now, coffee shops are really authentic right now, and all of them need the help and support of services. So um, what if you teamed up with five or six, uh, seven, uh, you know, community members and, and created kind of like a birch box uh, box that has gift certificates in it, some offerings. Absolutely. And let people get that as a gift when they yeah. come in, you know, when they come in, a quarterly gift, kind of like what Sephora is doing with their own vendors, do the same thing with your vendors, do the same thing with your community. And now you're involving not only your consumer, not only your staff and get some excitement in there, but you're also involving other potential clients and, and, and mavens that are going to talk about you. Right. There, there's two types of collaboration. Um, and the collaboration that we are recommending is that you network with the kind of people you've talked about uh, food places, coffee places, uh, lunch places, which would collaborate together. There's another way of collaboration that you have these vendors operating within your business if space permits. And therefore, it's there's a community area that consumers can go up and just really uh, have a glass of wine, um, have, a, have an espresso, which, and just hang out in that area. Now, it's a little difficult to do now, but we have to think past COVID. We, COVID will end. We all don't know when, but it will end. So we have to create a business that has multiple reasons why the consumer would come, multiple opportunities for marketing to them, and multiple opportunities for them to recommend other people and come back. Absolutely. I, I, you know, we just went and we, we had uh, some beer in this other place. And what was nice about it, uh, they brought us a glass, um, a drinking glass, like a beer glass. And inside all the utensils and they were plastic sealed. They all had saran wrap around it and brought it. I feel very comfortable with that. You right. know, we can still uh, look around and see what other businesses are doing. And they're doing a lot of things that that uh, make sense and we can incorporate it in our businesses. You know, as a salon owner, I've always looked to see uh, what other successful people are doing and, and learn from them. And that's exactly what we need to do. That's why we need to be creative. We need to be exploring and going, collaborating with other businesses so we can really build uh, the safety and the ex and, and the wow effect that is relevant to now mm -hmm. that, that will bring your your clients back on right now in the industry we're we're experimenting uh, a lot of drop in clients retention you know and um, even though we speak that the new luxury is safety like you said it's it's generic how can we how can we bring clients back how can we get we get them back to come to us and be and actually take a part of the market share because a lot of salons are op, are closing there's going to be a lot of clients that are going to look for a lot of salons there's going to be a lot of stylists that are looking for safer and and, and fun place this is our opportunity right now to tap into it You know, uh, I, I have, um, as you do, series of conversations with groups of salon owners and individual salon owners, uh, and we don't talk about the challenges within our industry. We recognize them and create a personal business model for them. Each salon has a different, they're at a different stage. They're a different size. Some are high profile, some are destination. But if you want to give a generic overview, um, for sure we can't do what we did before. COVID was the tipping point. Um, but quite frankly, um, the, the industry has been disrupted for a period of time with sweets and, and, and Amazon. So it's only because COVID hit that we now are at this 
critical point and we stand at the precipice of the future of the industry. So what do we do going forward is a, is a, a bespoke plan for each one. There isn't a one which you can say, this is what you do for the industry, the industry is going to be fine. Because no matter what you do in certain instances, some sounds won't survive. I think you said at the beginning. So the ones that will survive, the goal should be to maximize the average ticket, maximize the average profitability. And the kind of services that we would offer that we didn't offer. You mentioned last week hair restoration. Yes. If that's going to be big. Yes. Uh, because it's a it's a major, a major growth. So yeah. that's an income and a high profit area. Yeah. In some instances, and this isn't the panacea for the industry, we just talked about offering additional retail other than work products. Yes. Offering collaboration with wine bars or coffee bars where permitting. Yes. But we have to look at a higher average ticket and higher profitability. Absolutely. Because, you know, if, if there's no point, you know, we have a saying in England, turnover, which equates to sales here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Turnover <laughs> is, yeah. Profit is sanity. Mm -hmm. So whenever you do a business model, unless you're creating additional revenue each year, to offset your overheads and an increasing margin, then you're always going to struggle. So you have to be a forward thinker as the business is going well, you have to think, okay, what new services can I introduce that's gonna be profitable, has a good margin yeah. and sustainable, not a gimmick. You know, not a gimmick, sustainable, yeah. I, I looked at uh, uh, the wonderful success of Drybar Oh my God, I was just going to talk about this. Yes. Drybar has an incredible success because what it did, and a lot of people thought, well, how can you make money just doing blow dries? That's exactly what a lot of people think. It was completely the opposite, just right. like you mentioned. Yeah. yeah. Because people didn't want to be in that. So, but what Drybar did is they opened up in areas of high volume consumers yeah. with disposable yeah. income. Yeah. New York, Vegas. Places like that. LA, yeah. Yeah, LA, all those kind of places. And, and they also had, for the, the husbands or boyfriends, they had a, a wine bar in the, in the Vegas one, at least. Right. Um, and they had some retail products that they sold, but all they did is blow dry. Yeah. So what happened was um, people opened blow dry bars in a village somewhere and expected to be busy all the time. So it can't do something that's not sustainable. Um, 15, 20 years ago, the growth of day spas from salon owners that hadn't run a spa before right. had space and they opened day, day spas. When the economy was like that, they did well. Yeah. But when it didn't do well, the economy dropped, the day spas dropped yeah. because they didn't know how to run a spa properly they were really hairdressers that took the opportunity so, so, yeah. true. so true so true you got to think about the opportunity that you have and you know here's the thing you you got to try things you got to try all of those things so for example um if you don't research and you don't spend the time to see if it's going to work for you uh, then nothing is going to happen. Nothing is going to change. So again, it all starts with if you're a salon owner and you work from behind a chair most of your time, then most of your time will do really well from behind the chair. If you're a salon owner that also can invest, that needs to grow their business and needs to be in, in the profit area, then you got to start looking of how many hours are you investing in that, just that. So for example, if... Um, uh, if you wanted to create a new service because right now you're looking to do something new, to something profitable within the capacity of the times for sale that you have right now. First, you got to look at like, well, what services that you give right now that are profitable? What if none of them are profitable? Can you tweak that? Now, how do you do that? Can you measure the income that you bring in versus the outcome that goes in one hour? Can so, you look at an hour, right? Just to see where you are, just to see where you are. The, the reason that a lot of salon owners 
uh, work behind the chair or within the city that they started from um, is purely down to two words, comfort zone. The, the disruptors of our industry, the disruptors of any industry are people that work outside of their comfort zone. They have a different mindset than most people. And what we have to do is we have to look outside of our comfort zone and take a calculated, educated risk. Business is a risk. Yeah. The more diligence you put in pre-launch, greater is your chance of that success. Yeah. But you have to you have to step out of the comfort zone you're in because it goes along very nicely until it doesn't. Absolutely. And the price is outside of your hands. You get a walkout, you get a COVID, you get something. It's outside of your hands. Yeah. And all of a sudden, you're in crisis mode. And you don't want to be in crisis mode, especially, no. especially when there's... Yeah, especially when there's going to be always something coming your way, you know. It, how can you get out from always reacting into the fires? Uh, and the only way to do it is to allocate more time to working on the, um, you know, on your business. If you ask me as a business coach, uh, I am very, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a huge advocate of uh, make a decision. Do you want to run a company or do you want to run a chair? You know, because you can do so much better if you decided to run a chair and just run a chair. Or if you want to run a company, then you need to make that decision and go for it, right? And yes, the, it's not an overnight thing. You just don't quit cigarette overnight. Maybe some do and maybe some don't. But you do need to work on um, on spending the time on being creative, building those system, and understanding where are you with the relationship of your income. Otherwise, guys, you're threading water. You're just threading water and you can thread water now. And talking about the future, Leon, you're such an innovator. You've always been that way. Um, you know, you it's not that you're you build a business, you build many businesses, you saw the natural evolution of our industry. And it, you agree with me that in the past 50 years until 2020, not much of change, not much of change. So tipping point COVID, yes, on steroids, yes. But what is the future salons? Is going to look like well, you, you you hit on a point um in 1960 Vidal Sassoon revolutionized the industry by inventing uh, geometric cutting at a stroke in western hemisphere women didn't tease their hair anymore but they cut and blow dry nothing really has happened that revolutionary since Yes, there's been a growth in retail, but it's hardly been uh, revolutionary. And when you look at the model that we've had for many years, service commission sounds or team-based sounds, that's been the model. And I think 90% of commission, 10% uh, are uh, team-based. What we have is we have a different workforce we have a different millennial workforce with a different mindset. We did not have sweets 25 years ago. We didn't have Amazon 25 years ago. So we can't have a business model going forward that emulated the business model that was successful for everybody over the last 50 years. So how do we, how do we keep a model of a, a, a professional salon with a brand and not lose the talent to go to suites. And believe me, um, most people that leave the industry and go to suites, they're not that successful either. They are isolated. They have no further education. They really don't know how to market their business. Uh, the model they have isn't right. So what if we did a hybrid situation where you have independent people working within the model of your salon? 
nothing new up to now because we've had independent people working in the salon before. But the caveat is that the salon owner will not only get um, income from the pod or room, they will be able to sell services that the service provider can't do or doesn't want to do, like a laundry service. They could arrange education. They could arrange for having uh, some equipment. They could arrange to do the uh, accounts for the salon. They could arrange for a maitre d' to greet the people to bring it through. So you're personalizing the experience for them. To me, that business formula, the model will have to be profitable for the salon owner, desirable for the service provider, and attractive for the consumer. So we have to be a disruptor instead of disrupted. And so that hybrid model, which again, isn't right for the industry, it's right for some salons in the industry. That Here's and with your permission, I'm sharing your pods because I think that will illustrate a really good picture because I think that speaks to it. Um, you know, as, as Steve Jobs always say, if you ask, come from, you ask the question, what if? What right. if you created something? This so, is what you're talking about, right? Right. So th this, this is an example of a pod. I mean, the pods can be any size you want. It could be a six foot wide pod. It could be bigger, it could be a different material. But the idea is that people work within the pods and you have a different music system in each pod. You have a monitor connected to the consumer, so you never leave that pod. You don't actually go and check out, but you check out at the, at the seat when you're in the chair. Um, so this is a personal pod. It wasn't designed for COVID and it doesn't have to have a light box in it, but it, it, it does have COVID benefits because you're not connected to anybody else. And it's your business operating within a brand within that within that city. Yeah, and then I think that if we if we can adopt that, okay, like adopt the fact that uh, there's nothing wrong with hybrid. There's nothing wrong with it as long as you know your numbers, and as long as you have your mission, as long as you know where you're going, as long as you your missions align that story. The narrative has to match. So, you know, those pods can, um, can solve right now so many problems. It can solve the safety issue. It's, it can solve the, the, the fact that, um, you know, maybe you have to be six feet from each other, but don't feel, you don't want to feel alone and, and you still want to be in a collective environment. You can create such a personal service here. You can create... Um, uh, 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 more of a celebrity feeling uh, if you wanted to do hair restoration, for example. Right there, immediately, boom, you have, um, you know, a department right there for you. So I'd, I'd love for people to think about what if I can elevate the personal feeling, the safety feeling, and the look to match the, the future model of our running our business. And from a consumer and service provider's position where they are working with that pod, one of the key benefits to this is that there will be a community area, like the color area, where the service providers would not feel isolated. They could communicate with other people at the community area. There would be, in some instances, a community area where the consumers could connect with each other. If they want it, it's optional. So, you know, what you have to do when you think of something like that, you have to think of the greatest eventuality and then tailor it to the square footage and project that you're going for. Uh, obviously, on a new project, you can plan for all of this. On a remodel, it depends on the space. Uh, some places you could do it, some places you couldn't do it. But I think what you can't do is you can't continue to think, you know, I, I have a saying, you can't build the future with legacy thinking. Yeah, I love that, yeah. You can't build the future with legacy thinking. And, and today's initiatives, what we decide today, are tomorrow's minimum standards 
with increasing rapidity. Yeah. So, you know, as I, I, I if, if I, I did a podcast, say a month ago, I guarantee you, if I did the same group now, some of my thinking would have evolved because life evolves and business evolves. Yeah. So you have to be constantly evolving your your thinking. Your thinking. Yeah. And that manifests in your business model. Yeah. You can't relax, rely on saying, this is what I did last month. This is what I'm going to do this month. That's what I'm going to do next month. Right. That, that's, that's not really a growing model. You yeah. always have to reinvent yourself and reinvent your business. And if you're an entrepreneur, it goes hand in hand. Um, you know, and I totally agree with you. You know, what, what we discussed a couple of months ago um, has the basics of our conversation and dialogue today. But what we really want to drive is to ask yourself, and what if, look, when a baby, when a, a child of, of a, a three-year-old child is learning how to uh, tie their shoelaces for the first time, they're not going to get it on the first time. They're going to have to practice this over and over again, but they have the idea. What if I can do this on my own? What if I can tie it? And you know, the, the human brain wants to learn, wants to be independent. The minute you tell the brain that I am going to be successful, I am going to be profitable, I am going to get through this weird, bizarre times, it's going to find a way to do it. It's going to. So what if we can think about and provoke an ideas with all of the audience here today and ask you, what if you created a model that works for profitability, that works for your values, that works for the life that you want to hold in your company? What would that be? You know, I think, uh, Leon, if we can summarize three things, things that they should consider or we should all consider right now uh, to maybe specifically to do to help you guys with with sure. the sustainability. What, well, what would, in your opinion, you would focus I on? I have uh, four or five quick bullet points that I can share with you that I think some of them we've covered in this presentation. Yes. One, important, you don't own a startup. You own a business that has to be in the beauty industry. Two, invest in technology. Technology within within the salon. Uh, there, there are salons in, in Europe now that have no desk. They walk out, they're charged with their card, like you do in a hotel. You, when you finish with a hotel, you, you go out. You, you have a touch screen for retail. You invest in technology because that's going to be the future. Absolutely. Three, we touched on this. Study the best retailers, the best marketers, the best service providers, and emulate the best practices that they, they practice. Four, design is the number one determinant why a consumer buys something. We all have different clothing. We all have different cars. We all have different watches. What made us buy that particular watch, clothes, or car was design. So design is the number one determinant. You look around your business and say, you know, why is Apple Store so successful? They only have six real products, but the design brings you in. Why, why when you look at a restaurant, you say, that looks good? Because it looks inviting and designed. So design's important. Collaborate with other vendors. Uh, we talked on that. Uh, implement a strategic plan, uh, a strategic blueprint. And the last thing I wanted to share was understand your consumer. Yes. We train people for hair technology. We train them for color. We don't train them to understand the emotional needs of the consumer. The best retailers and marketers get that right. Apple understands their consumer. They change their verbiage. Yeah. The consumer. You know, Apple... Uh, in, Staff are trained to not say unfortunately. You know, something they can't do. They don't say unfortunately. They say, as it turns out. Okay. Everything, That's a great one. Yeah, everything is in 
the positioning. Everything in life is in the positioning, how you position it. Yeah. So those are the kind of summaries, points that I would strongly suggest that we look at our business that way. I think it's brilliant. I think all of these are, uh, we, we, we spoke of it today in the dialogue and that was a good summary. Um, the last point that you said by design was a little bit confusing for me in the beginning until you brought up uh, the, the look, the image, uh, who are they attracting? Who are they speaking to? Um, and I think that's something that uh, as a consumer right now, I would say it's really great if you understood, you heard, and you know who is your ideal clients that you want to work and want to attract uh, to your company. And right now, I think it's so vital for you to have almost like an inventory checkout, an inventory check of um, who do you want to attract here to your company? Who do you want to work with? And then build the brand according to that. And that's the design you're talking about. It, it is. I mean, you know, every every aspect of your business, you know, you, you need to sit in every area of your salon from every angle because that's exactly what consumers do. And look at that business. Is it compatible? Does the color area look good? But the, the shampoo doesn't. Does, you need to have an overall image. Wherever you walk in uh, Apple Store, from any angle, you see a design that's compatible and consistent. Absolutely. So I love everything we touch base, um, uh, you know, for anybody who's interested to learn more about uh, all of this, uh, you can always reach to Leon. He's got so much great designs, uh, perspective and ideas. Uh, also to, to let everybody know that, um, you know, all of these are very, not so expensive and they're very current and very validated things that you can implement right away. It doesn't cost you to go to your neighbor's uh, brewery, coffee shop, and collaborate with them uh, and do something together. It doesn't, uh, the, the pod is not a huge investment. Um, you know, think about how you can change your front desk experience to become, like Leon says, a Metro D ex experience, where instead of, you know, hiring a front desk reception, hire a host. Yeah, a host or a maitre d' that really um, has the experience of the consumer in mind. They're not trying to book appointments. They're not trying to answer the phone. They're not trying to fulfill. They're actually listening with the intent to understand and, and, and escorting them through and making sure that there's a continuity between the front, the back, and from there to the shampoo area and the color area. So, you know, it, it, if, wherever you are, whatever zone you're in the salon, you get a series of experiences that make the ultimate consumer experience. I love it. I think we touched a lot of great points today. We talk about the elephant in the room and uh, I, I cannot be more grateful and thankful for you being here, Leon. We've been doing this for a few weeks together. I'm so fortunate, not yeah. unfortunate, very fortunate. Uh, and I can't wait to give more. So thank you for, for coming, Leon, today. And for everybody out there, um, keep tuning on, uh, in every week. Next week, we have Alok, uh, Alok, who is a really good friend. He is uh, a sales guru, and he is a business coach. He has done some tremendous uh, coaching in all of the industries and i would love to share with you guys how you can implement everything we talked about today with leon so um have a great week and keep thinking forward and implementing creativity time thank you so much guys i can't wait to see you next time thank you thank you bye bill i saw you there <laughs>